Good evening to you all, wherever you are in the world. I hope you are surviving and staying safe. Please uh, join us tonight. The British Interplanetary Society welcomes you to the third live Q&A. And I hope that you have all had the chance to watch Mark Hempsell's excellent presentation on engineering the scorpion. And we've got quite a lot of questions in already. But if you need to, please live or please uh, come back to me on the email streaming at bis-space.com. Now, we're fortunate to have Mark with us tonight, and he is available to answer any of your questions. So I'll let him introduce you, himself, and then I'll get on with the questioning. Over to you, Mark. Hi, Alistair. Yes. Well, I'm Mark Hempsell. Um, I sort of just this year retired from a career in astronautics which started with British Aerospace 
then went on for a period of teaching astronautics at the Bristol University and then went to reaction engines. Um, and really, to some extent, what I've been doing is looking back at the lost opportunities uh, over my career, a somewhat wistful old man's grumpy complaint about what we should have done instead of what we actually did. Um, so, uh, so there we are. I've just seen uh, Alistair's thing. How are we doing, Alistair? <laughs> right. Well, I'm ready for the first first question. Okay. And it comes in from one of our members, actually, Les Shoulder. Uh, who is actually uh, based in East London on the Essex borders. And he asks if a national space agency were to start a Scorpion class space program today, given a reasonable budget, in what time scale would you envisage an Earth lunar mission being achievable? Um, time scales are always difficult. And uh, I haven't done a time scale version of the program. So I can't give you a definitive answer to that. It would first of all depend on having the right launch system to support the build and the operations. But typically programs like this can be done in seven to 10 years. If you do them much quicker, you take risks and spend more money. If you go much slower, it costs more money and you just don't get there as fast. So my guess would be seven to 10 years, assuming that you've got the launch infrastructure in place. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I have another question just come in. I'll uh, just read that one out for you. Just one second while I find it. Uh -huh. Right. It is from Mike Lawford, and he is a member of the British Interplanetary Society based in Harpenden. And he says, thanks to Mark for a really interesting and well-presented talk. I'd like to ask about the economics behind the Scorpion. How much would he have envisaged the cost to be in relation to the cost of shuttle and the ISS, or indeed Artemis? Right, right. Well, you gave me warning of this question, so I've actually got a few slides prepared because it is quite a, um, a challenging uh, subject. Okay, so you should be seeing a slide uh, with a Skylon cost. Um, the starting point is how much does it cost to launch the kit? And that's all assuming Skylon. It assumes 20 million per Skylon flight. Now, the cost per Skylon flight is a very variable number, depending on your assumptions on the utilization rate and how you did the development. So I've taken this from a paper that was published in Africa, Astronautica four years ago. And this is optimistic by the standards of that paper that was looking at Skylon replacing Ariane 6. Um, but it's sort of kind of pessimistic if you look at other high volume utilization levels. Okay, so that's what we're going to use for the launch. If we then go on to look at what it costs to develop a Scorpion, you see here uh, parametrically costed development budget and how much it costs to build each one. This was done by Bob Parkinson, and you can see that the total is about 40 billion uh, to develop, but half of that is the nuclear engine. That's something we're not too certain about. Alan Bond, myself, and Bob Parkinson had quite a bit of discussion over that. So that's, that's the, the flakiest figure there because we just don't have a good comparison. I'd also point out that the ANZU system, which is the capsule, uh, is a completely separate spacecraft, and you may have such a capsule elsewhere and not need to develop it. Um, okay, so that's what it gets cost to develop, and you can see each unit build is about two and a half billion. If you then look at what it actually costs per vehicle, assuming that you make five, you can see you pay back the development cost, you've got that. 2.5 billion to build it actually. It needs launches, and you can see there's 28 Skylon launches at 20 million. And then you, it needs an assembly spine, which costs about 6 billion. And so you've got to put your, um, your contribution into that. So the, the total comes to about 12 billion. What I would point out is if you had built more than five and got into high numbers, or you wrote off the 
development costs, they actually cost about a little over three billion per vehicle. And then the cost per flight, well, it, it takes about 50 Skylon flights to get ready for a flight. So that's um, about a billion. And then we want to pay back that 12 billion that we've invested in. So that's 20 flights. Uh, so it's about 1.6 billion a flight, which is about the same as a shuttle mission costed on the same basis. If you have that three to five vehicles and each does 20 missions, again, very much like a sort of the space shuttle program, then the total program cost is about 160 billion, which again was in the same ballpark figure as the cost per the, um, per, for the space shuttle. Um, the ISS comes pro total program cost is over a hundred billion, uh, and but, but not a precise number yet for obvious reasons. Uh, but you've got to be careful there because some of that hundred billion is also in the in the shuttle number. Um, so I don't have yet really good ideas on the cost of Artemis, so I can't uh, really comment on that. But all about the same, same cost levels. Uh, did that cover the question, Alistair? Well, I think so. Yes, I got I got so involved in it that I was actually um, uh, remiss and hadn't got my next question lined up. Uh, I think that was excellent and nice to see the slides. And um, I think I understand it a bit clearer now. Uh, right, let's go quickly into the next question, and it is again from Les Shoulder. And he is still in East London on the Essex border. Uh, you did not mention SpaceX during the talk. Perhaps it was intentional. But where would you place the Starship program if they succeed in their fixes on the crushing of the, uh, the well, it's, he's called it the old Coca-Cola can, uh, in the graph of payload velocity on a typical Moon or Mars mission? Okay, right. Well, we better get back to looking at that uh, graph uh, that was in the thing. Um, I'm afraid I didn't have a chance to add um, what SpaceX are doing. SpaceX are using a uh, methane uh, LOX system, and its performance is quite a bit below the hydrogen LOX. So their curve would be uh, quite a bit lower than the, the, the one you see there. Um, what uh, Elon Musk emphasized at his first announcement of that is that he's believing in refueling. So he's going to have a vehicle that doesn't have uh, quite the sort of the step capability, but he's going to keep refueling it on the way, um, which is fine in a way, except... You've got to get the fueling dumps there in the first place, which is why he's got a tanker version of it. I don't actually yet fully understand how his Starship is supposed to work as an infrastructure. Um, and I have a problem with uh, SpaceX stuff. When Elon Musk first announces it, you get lots of very exciting um, sort of view graphs. I remember one which showed a Dragon 1 landing men on Mars. Uh, the problem is um, that's not what ends up being built. Uh, hopefully, you're seeing me again. Um, so you, you, so I, I don't really feel comfortable answering about Starship until I see what actually, in the end, is built by the uh, by SpaceX. It'll be it'll be better than we've got, but what SpaceX end up building is better than we've got, but never quite, we're in fact always a long way short of the initial Elon Musk um, airbrush vision, which after all, so the, the one he showed in Mexico showed Starship flying around Saturn with a solar sail to power it. And I think a lot of us were thinking, maybe not that. We'll see. Well, we'll wait and see. Thank you very much for that one. <coughs> Uh, right, we've got a, a question now from Alan Marlow, who we all know, um, uh, yeah. a member of the British Interplanetary Society, and in fact, uh, working it all out for us and making it all happen tonight, based in Milton Keynes. And he says, practically, how would Scorpion be refueled? Would Skylon 
would a, a Skylon re-entry or resupply vehicle pull up alongside and an astronaut get out to hook up a refueling hose? Uh, right. Uh, again, I have, because it was Alan and I had advance notice of the question, I can, uh, I have prepared a little picture just for Alan. And here it is. Um, what happens is the Skylon will always dock at the port and the top of the cupola, the central port. Uh, and if it's carrying cargo, then those manipulator arms can remove the cargo and place it on the ports in the uh, on the on the Scorpion. If it's a refueling flight, uh, hopefully you can see there's two. I don't know if the cursor comes up. There's two ports here. One's oxygen, one's hydrogen. And you can see the fueling lines come in. So once it's docked, it directly connects to those refueling ports and can unload the hydrogen or the oxygen, depending on which it's carrying, via those ports. Um, uh, beyond that, I have not really thought the thing through much beyond that. Uh, so uh, does that answer that question? Yes, I, I think so. Thank you. I, and we did see the cursor move, so we do know where the fuel came in. So that, that was very helpful. Um, right, I have question five now from Les Shoulder again. And he's, uh, he's asking, I may have missed the answer during the talk, but given an adv advantageous Earth-Mars position, what would the flight time for a Scorpion-type craft be and how long could a mission be, assuming there was no resupply of consumables? Right. Well, Scorpion doesn't do anything special on, on Mars missions. It can do both conjunction and opposition class missions. Uh, and the times can vary quite widely, but typically you're talking around three years. And that's the value that I've been using when looking at how much supplies. Uh, it can carry on the Mars mission. Um, I should have brought that up as a slide. Um, I'm not sure as if oh, I might be able to find it. So if I if you'll forgive me for muttering a little bit while I try and find the the slide in question, which I should have prepared but didn't. Um, OK, let's see if we can get this one working. OK. Uh, right. This is in the video. These two supplies modules. Um, are what's carrying the bulk of the 30 tons of supplies. The remainder is in the supply region in the hub module. Um, so, so that could be a good three years um, or even more. It depends on how much boost you give the Scorpion to put it on its way because it can't actually do the whole mission by itself. <coughs> it does need a bit of help to get it on its way. And depending on the size of that help, depends on how much supplies you can carry um, or other equipment and what missions you do. So there's a lot of options there. But as I say, I'm not doing anything that other people uh, haven't done. And, and three years would be um, the sort of number you'd be talking about. Great, thank you. Um, right, I'm going to give you a, a long question here. Um, okay. This is, this is from Patrick Mann, a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society and I4IS <laughs> man, mm -hmm. Initiative for Interstellar Studies, who we all know. Yeah, we do. And he says, thank you for sharing your design study for the Scorpion spacecraft concept, both in the online lecture and the design study outlined in your July 2019 JBIS paper. I think you have made a convincing argument that the space industry is indeed governed by Martin's law with a lack of political will being the primary reason why human spaceflight retrenched following the, the Apollo moon landings. Having accepted that premise, I have two questions I would like to ask you, looking at where we are right now. What is the first thing you would change in order to put us on a more forward-looking path in, to an ambitious future manned spaceflight program? Right. Um, I I think I would first of all um, uh, say Martin's Law doesn't, are you seeing Martin's Law? 
Have I got Martin's Law up on the screen? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to get up. Um, uh, are, are you seeing Martin's Law on the screen, Alistair? Yes, I am. Yep. Right. Um, the, the first point is Martin's Law was not really just about political will. It was about the fact that political considerations, whether it be a lack of will or whether it be trying to get something for your country or whatever, completely and utterly dominate what happens in space rather than what technically makes sense to achieve the objective. An example would be why are there five different designs for laboratory modules on the ISS when you could have made one of them five times and got a much better much cheaper solution. That's an example of Martin's law showing uh, that works. And what I was trying to do to some extent with the Scorpio study was reverse it and say, let's go for the objective, technically the best way of doing it, and then worry about how we do it politically at the end. So I wanted to make that point that Martin's law isn't just about it. However, he's right that the in this instance, the post Apollo it was the lack of political will that um, that caused us to to lose it. Um, what I would do first is I kind of obvious. I hope, hate to sound sound like a stuck record, but Skylon is by far the most important development uh, that should be being done at the moment. Uh, everything else hinges on that. If you can get Skylon operational. You get the capabilities to do anything, including scorpions. But um, so every time I see somebody saying, I want to do this in space, I want to do Salapas satellites, I want to return to the moon, whatever it is, the answer is, well, you start by making Skylon. Uh, so so that's, that would be my top priority on, on whatever the question is on what you want to do. OK, well, we've got the second part of the uh, question here. The design study focuses primarily on the use of Skylon as the means of launching Scorpion's components into Earth orbit. But your July 2019 JBIS paper also references a 2003 JBIS paper of yours on the potentially complementary role of expendable heavy lift vehicles in the construction of large on-orbit space infrastructure. Do you see any role for, e.g., SpaceX's Falcon Heavy or similar vehicles in helping to move us towards the vision you've laid out here? Right, that's such an interesting question. Uh, the original uh, 2003 paper didn't just say expendable heavy vehicles, it just looked at heavy lift vehicles that have a cost disadvantage to the space plane where you get, an, you, you get your money back by making it easier to make things in space. And if you had a heavy lift vehicle delivering the components for the uh, Scorpion, it would be easier to make and you might, might save some money. It would look a little different, but it would be a viable approach. Um, it, the, the real matter is, can you afford to have a heavy lift vehicle, which is a, it's kind of a little bit of a luxury. But you'll notice it is the launch architecture that the post-Apollo program had. Um, I, Falcon Heavy is, uh, it's nice to have the 50 tons, but the payload envelope is rather constricting for 50 tons. And I suspect that vehicle is actually designed not to put 50 tons into a low earth orbit, but to put lesser tonnage into things like polar orbits because it, it looks perfectly matched for American military satellites which I think is what he was aiming at. I've looked at um, Blue Origin, who a company I'm very interested in. Their new Glen would give me 40 tons. It would give me uh, another one and a half meters diameter. And I always like diameter when I'm launching stuff. So it would make things easier. It's not a necessity, but if you told me I had a heavy lift vehicle at a reasonable price, yeah, that's probably the way you would put it together. Right. Well, thank you. I hope everyone's got the answers that they expected or asked for. <laughs> um, right. 
we're moving on now. Oh, another one from Les Shoulder, still oh. in East London and the Essex border. And he says, should a future moon Mars pioneer choose a Scorpion class mission or a SpaceX Starship mission? And what advantages has one over the other? Um, well, I have to refer you partly to my previous answer that I'm not abundantly sure how Starship works yet. Um, for, for the moon, there, there's a whole range of options and the, the, the answer to the best way of getting to the moon rather depends on where you're starting from. With regards to interplanetary flight, such as going to Mars, um, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a stickler for having artificial gravity, for having storm shelter radiation protection, and for having a means of leaving the spacecraft, if you have to, with the intention that you fly in a fleet, which is what the post-Apollo program is going to do. So if one spacecraft goes down, at least the crew can then get to another spacecraft and hopefully get home. Um, and I don't think that the Starship has any of those features on it. So I would say uh, if I were uh, a multi-billionaire, and I think we can all agree it's a great tragedy that I'm not, uh, I would be going for a Scorpion route uh, with a Skylon. But uh, I have to say, it's not my money, and they're going to have to go the route they think is best. Right. Well, thank you. I think you've put them in their place there. Um, let's move on. Ah, there's another question, actually, which follows on from that, again from Les Shoulder. And he says, if the strengths of both class of spaceship could be combined, what would you envisage its impact on future long-term manned space flight would be? Mm. This raises uh, two interesting points. Um, the first one is uh, the paper I delivered at Rice Space where I looked at going to the moon. Um, I saw once you're on the moon and you've, you've built yourself propellant depots and you're having lunar oxygen in situ resource, it actually then pays to return to using chemical rockets for the, the up-down trip. Uh, so sort of if we take sort of Starship as a, a low technology chemical engine that you keep refueling, I think that comes in but it's actually ironically something that comes later once you've used your scorpion type craft to open up the territory and put in the fixed bases and support infrastructure needed to make that work the other thing uh, which i'm looking at in the scorpion program and, and one of the key things that i've still got to sort of finalize is i'm looking for the slippery slope i'm looking for the point where your launch and transport infrastructure enables you to do anything in space that you're not constrained anymore and that's why you'll see on the scorpion um study is also looking at things like space colonies because i'm finding that skylon and scorpion type spacecraft are all you need to support things like space colonies um and i don't see that that sort of slipping point that that's all you need to get to that point with things like SpaceX's and Blue Origins, which at the moment, what they're offering the payload is a cheaper, but essentially almost analogous ride to an expendable vehicle. Um, so I think um, the, 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 the combination is, is, is there. You, 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 once you've got a mature infrastructure, you can use craft that are appropriate for that mission point. And the final point I make on the answer I've just given you is, although I'm saying that Skylon and a Scorpion type spacecraft are all you need to get to the point of space colonies and wherever you want to go, um, I'm not saying that then you wouldn't, there wouldn't need, there wouldn't be later variations. I'm sure you can improve on Skylon once it's operational. I'm sure you can improve on the Scorpion. You don't absolutely need to to make it happen, is what I'm saying. Right. Well, thank you. Um, a comprehensive answer there. Right. From Bob Morris, we have a question. He is uh, a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society and chairman of the Northern Space Consortium. based in. Uh, he's based in sunny Formby. I think it's sunny everywhere at the moment. 
Um, right. And he says, I wanted to say how much I enjoyed Mark's presentation. I also am of the Apollo generation and fully remember the post-Apollo plans and other great proposed projects at the time. I fully agree with Mark that the current NASA plans for manned space are not really addressing the real issues and fail to see how they can lead to sustained development and exploration. Zero G and radiation shielding need to be provided before we will see sustained manned exploration. I'd be interested to know from Mark whether he is aware of any current plans anywhere for such a vehicle and who, if anyone, is seriously working on zero G and proper shielding. Um, well, the simple answer is no, I don't know of anybody else working on it uh, or even close. Uh, artificial gravity is something that it's, it's a constant puzzle to me why we haven't at least done the space experiments to establish what level of spin can people tolerate without being sick and, and operationally inefficient, which is not something we've been able to determine on the ground. Uh, and we also don't know what level of artificial gravity we need to sort of correct the problems of microgravity. So, um, and all it needs is, you know, one, one spinning space station and a program of a few years and we'll have those answers forever and we just never get, seem to get there uh with radiation protection again it's a bit of a puzzle there there is um belated radiation protection being added to the iss um particularly around the crew sleeping quarters they're putting in uh, three inches of um of plastic um but but it does rather look like it was an afterthought that, that people have not grasped really what you need to put into a spacecraft to ensure that you have protected against solar storms when you need to, but also not amplified the galactic radiation uh, to make things worse. And the space station does. It actually amplifies the galactic radiation in terms of the damage it does to the body. Um, so I think in both cases, we're still just, we, we're not even implementing what we know we ought to be do, doing. Um, right. Well, thank you very much, Mark. We've got a few more questions coming in. So um, we're actually uh, halfway through our session, so I'll, I might have to speed up a bit. Um, we've got from John Davis. He asks, why fly the serpent engine down to the lunar surface on a ferry mission? Clearly, it can be a power source for a long-duration surface mission, but it is a dead weight if you simply need to descend, land, unload, ascend, and return to low lunar orbit. As an aside, if it is to be the core of a long-term base, then it has no need to carry chemical fuel for the ascent to lunar orbit, but that is part of the plan, I assume. Over to you. Okay, now this question is actually one we found on the YouTube channel. Uh, it wasn't streamed in, so I've seen this uh, put in a couple of hours ago. Um, the first point is why essentially fly the whole Scorpion down to the surface and why not use uh, a separate lunar lander? And, and the reason for that is that lunar landers are expensive to develop. And I was trying to get a thing where you've got your one big development, and once you have that big development, you can do everything with what you've developed, uh, except land on Mars, you do need that special Martian lander. And as I pointed out at the Rice Space Conference, uh, when you've got that established and mature and you want to evolve, then you can have specialist landers that actually operate more efficiently, particularly if you're using lunar, uh, lunar uh, oxygen. Um, the... The other point about the the need for the chemical engines on the lunar landing is is twofold. One is they're there because they're controllable and therefore can do that final descent and an ascent. Um, but the other reason there is there is to make sure when you take off that you get yourself above fifty kilometers from the lunar surface before you put the uh, open up the serpent engine. The serpent engine when it's quiescent, 
um, has the fuel in a storage locker, which is shielded. And when it goes in to be used, you take it out the locker and into the uh, reaction chamber. And then you don't want to be anywhere near it, but unless you're behind the shielding that's there for the crew. So you've got to be 50 kilometers above the lunar surface in order not to fry the astronauts that are on the lunar surface. Um, so that's why the chemical fuel is is there and the the thing is sized to be able to descend from 50 kilometers and then ascend to 50 kilometers so that no one on the surface ever sees the radiation levels that they otherwise would. Uh, thank you thank you very much um right we've got one that you won't have seen uh before yep. this and it's <laughs> from uh, nigel fudge uh, oh Ange and nigel and it says uh thank you very very much for the interesting presentation what do you do with your concepts in the sense of which organizations do you share them with or which people and what feedback have you had in general and are, you, are your working concepts appreciated? Have any parts of them been incorporated by ESA or NASA or the like? And specifically, did you share your Scorpion project with them? And finally, do you share them for free or for profit through your organization? Um, right. Uh, the answer on uh, previous studies I've done when I was with British Aerospace, obviously they were there for British Aerospace's use and that varied depending on what the project and we normally did those with ESA. Uh, with reaction engines, of course, reaction engines funding uh, has come from a variety of sources, uh, shareholders and, and, and government. And the, where we did studies there, uh, they, would, they were done to test Skylon's payload capability. Uh, we wanted to make sure that as we fixed the Skylon user manual and the payload interfaces, that we weren't cutting off future routes by not thinking about them at that point. Um, with regards to the Scorpion, uh, the Scorpion is not being shared with anybody other than through the public medium of issuing papers and giving talks. Um, it's, I'm not expecting people to sort of suddenly rush out and build Scorpions. I'm just trying to illustrate the gap between what we are capable of building and what we've actually got and are planning to build. And I think that gap is unacceptably large if you really think it's important that humanity moves into space, which, of course, I do. Um, so, And the other thing is, yes, I do it for free. Um, I have not yet managed to make a penny out of the Scorpion. Uh, no, that's not quite true. I've made six pounds in Amazon royalties out of a short story that involves one. Um, so, uh, did that? Did <laughs> well, let's let's uh, we'll celebrate next time we can get back to a pub. <laughs> well, that would cost me the six pounds I've made, wouldn't it? Well, getting there or buying the round? Yes, possibly. <laughs> um, right, we've got another question in here from Colin Bright. And he works with uh, Alan Marlowe and based in Milton Keynes. Oh. And he's asking, given the only two logical long-term power sources for space exploration are either solar or nuclear, the latter favoring deep space exploration, why do you think NASA and other organizations like SpaceX and Boeing have been so reluctant to develop, to develop this type of propulsion systems? and still don't appear to be doing so. Right, OK. Um, right, well, the, 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 I think there's two answers to that. The first is you did notice the 20 billion price tag for the engine, uh, and a solar array doesn't cost you anything like that amount. Um, the problem with a solar array for this application is uh, that you need the gigawatts of power. Um, once you've said, I want a certain thrust level and you want at least 200 tons, and then you want a very high specific impulse, you are immediately into the very high gigawatt level and you need nuclear power to deliver that at a mass that is consistent with the vehicle. Um, if you did, if you developed that uh, gigawatt level of power 
using a solar array, you are literally talking arrays with tens of kilometers dimensions, and it's clearly not practical. Now, I think on the, it's an interesting history. At the time of the post-Apollo, I think NASA was almost too gung-ho about nuclear. It was doing the Nerva nuclear engine um, and spraying the Arizona desert with radioactive material because they put the hydrogen through the core and therefore some of the core eroded away. Um, and they also, if you look at the post-Apollo program space stations, they don't seem to have solar rays on them. That's because they were also working on a nuclear power um, plant uh, to do, do up electricity for their space stations and other applications, which interestingly also they were developing a lithium transfer loop, the same as we're using in the Serpent engine. Um, so anyway, they were sort of planning on having a, a nuclear reactor under the astronaut's bed to power the space station. I exaggerate slightly for comic effect, but not much. Um, and I think when they sort of got cold feet, I think there's a real shock when the post-Apollo program and, the, and, and what happened after the Apollo program, when they were cut back so savagely, a very almost too gung-ho organization suddenly became a very timid organization. And, you know, you've got to have a bit of courage to get yourself into a nuclear game. I think the arguments for nuclear power in space are very different from the pro and con arguments for nuclear power on the Earth. I consider them as two completely separate arguments, um, and there's pros and cons in both cases. But for getting the power density for vehicles that go beyond chemical, I think, uh, assuming you need the thrust levels, which for human spaceflight you do, then you're stuck with nuclear. Um, uh, so I think that's why, you know, the Serpent engine really produces something that, that you can't get by any other way. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mark. We've uh, got another question in from Nigel Fudge. And he's asking, actually, I think you may have answered this already, but let's let's ask it again. Is the nuclear engine plutonium or uranium powered? Oh, I haven't answered it. And it's uranium. It's enriched uranium. Oh, right. Uh, 83 kilograms of enriched uranium in the in that core vehicle. Yeah, that, that was a simple question, Alistair. You didn't need to disappear. Well, I, I, I have to find the next one because we've got another five or six just coming. Um, right. How I should you... point out to people, Alistair disappears off the screen and I have no idea what's going on. I'm just well, talking to a blank it's, screen. It's all right. I'm watching myself on my phone at the same time, so I know when I disappear. Um, right. I've got one here from Harry Prestige. And I just need to bring it up so that I can actually read it. Right, he's asking the question. He says, during the presentation, you suggest that the inside of the crew cabin at the front of the vehicle needs to rotate internally mm -hmm. to do this. This mm -hmm. feels like a complex mechanism. Why not just build it configured for the artificial gravity position? Oh, boy, did I try to do that. Um I don't think it's that complicated a mechanism. It's just a simple rotating ring by 90 degrees. So it's not, it's, it's not a massively complex mechanism. But, yeah, it it's, it's, wouldn't be my first choice. The problem is I couldn't find a configuration that worked for the spin, but then also worked when you apply the thrust from the nuclear engine and also worked when you landed on the moon. Um, and that's why, in the end, I... I I clung on for nearly two years before I, I bit the bullet and said, look, I'm going to have to rotate that cabin in order to give it that uh, ability. Uh, it, even if you weren't landing on the moon, I still think there would be an, uh, it would be difficult when you apply the thrust levels to the uh, on the engines. Um, but... Uh, I, in the end, I didn't think it was, was that much of an issue. There, there are actually not too many connections between that HAB module and the rest of the spacecraft. Um, so sort of having a, a, a sort of a, a, a connection that can accommodate that 
90 degree turn in the end didn't look that that difficult um so i agree it's not the most elegant thing in the world but i couldn't think of a better way of doing it right well thank you we've got to move on a few more coming in and this is from russ palmer who is again a fellow of the british interplanetary society based in essex and he's asking the question after saying most interesting talk but may i ask has nasa or isa shown interest on the scorpion proposal i think you partly answered that one <laughs> none, none at all <laughs> right well I'll, I'll leave myself on while i find the next one i don't think we've got a, any further answers to that one. <laughs> well it, no it, it's um nasa and isa don't really respond to this sort of thing um and uh so no uh they they haven't but then on the other hand look at the battles we've had with isa over skylon and which was um it it took years to get them to even and, and oh, i won't go into the details but we did eventually get them to give us a study in order to allow us to show them that we could do what Ariane 6 is going to do um, and, and much, much more. And so, and, and we got good, good, good money out of them, which I'm regret to say is probably British taxpayers money out of them to do that study. Uh, and um, I'm sure the shredding machine worked very hard as soon as we delivered it. Uh, so, uh, so no. <laughs> they probably didn't understand it. Right, I have another question actually in from uh, Mike Lawford again. Mm -hmm. And he says, I think Mark had said in his presentation that he'd been working on this design for something like six years. Mm -hmm. So is it the finished article now? Or does he have plans to do any more work to further expand on his design? Um, he, but, uh, before you get yeah. to answer this one, if not, what is he going to focus on next and why? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I'm not planning on doing much more on the Scorpion. Um, I did add a little niggle uh, in November after the IC when I saw a very interesting paper on inspection robots that were free flying. And I thought, oh, yeah, of course, the Scorpion would have those. So on some of the images, you'll find there's two boxes um, beyond the cupola. And those are images that are made afterwards. But no, I'm not going to play with the Scorpion now. Uh, I think it, it, it's made its point. It's proved its point. What I am doing is looking at that slippery slope, trying to prove, at least to my satisfaction, that the infrastructure that it can then support can open up the whole of space uh, and there is no need for further development in the transport infrastructure. In other words, we've got the capability uh, to at least occupy Earth and near planetary space without any further technical um, developments or understanding. So you'll see more work on um, the lunar infrastructure and more work on space colonies is what I think will come out next. Right, we look forward to it then, Mark. So um, I've got one actually from Steve Salmon, another fellow of the British Interplanetary Society living in London. This one's going to be good. It's a, it's a simple one, this. Um, he's enjoyed your talk and uh, he... Um, he then says it's a great article also in April's edition of Spaceflight magazine. Yeah, I didn't write that, so I can safely say I thought Davy's article was brilliant. Uh, it really nailed with different thoughts what I was trying to get at and put a different perspective on it. So I really did enjoy Dave Baker's article on it. He, he, he must have used your notes. No, he, no it, was, it caught me by surprise. He said he was just going to summarise the paper. So when he, I read it, and it wasn't, it was this historical analysis of the the philosophy behind the original Apollo and how I sort of resurrected that philosophy. Yeah. Um, I thought, yes, well, yeah, you know, 
good on him for that. Anyway, yes, right. sorry. Right. Well, the question asked, he says, I fear I may have missed the de detail, but where did the idea for the name of Scorpion come from? Is it an anachronism? No, it's not. No. Um, right. In the early days, the engine was going to be rotatable. Um, I'd envisaged that when it landed on the moon, it would then raise the, the engine to get it further away from the surface, not realising how good the uh, um, storage radiation shelter was. And I did actually do a sum and discovered that if I'd done that, um, it would actually make the environment worse. Um, but by then I'd named the thing because it was a, a, a system that could raise a, raise a sting on its tail. And by then, as you might know, I'm doing a little bit of science fiction based on it. And by then, I'd already worked Scorpion in as a metaphor in some of the science fiction. So I stuck with the name. Um, I should also point out, because it, everything seems to begin with an S in our world, it's a coincidence that it begins with an S. It's a coincidence that Skylon begins with an S. But it's not a coincidence that all the engines begin with an S because it's a tradition that a British rocket, uh, a British liquid rocket engine begins with an S, and that goes back to the 1950s. Right, well, we, uh, we remember the 50s quite well. Um, I've got a, a question, actually, you'll probably know, from Patrick Rennie from Reaction Engines, and he asked the question after thanking you for an inspiring talk and concept. His question is, how do you envisage the potential development of Scorpion? You mentioned the similarities to the Apollo program, but mm. Europe has significantly smaller appetite. Would this have, be, have to be an American program? Um, right. OK, again, I would point out I'm not proposing this as a program. So I, I'm not saying drop everything, fellas, go make scorpions. I'm just pointing out that whatever you're doing, look at a scorpion and say, how does this compare with what I could be doing? So I'm trying to get people to raise their sights on their programs rather than do my specific program. Um, the development costs are, as I say, comparable with shuttle, comparable with the International Space Station. So you could envisage it as an international program, which uh, Europe has got involved in Artemis, it's got involved in the ISS, it got involved in the shuttle program with Space Lab. So uh, Europe could have a, on a program like this, Europe could have a significant role to play. What I think it's bad at is initiating ideas. We always seem to think that the, the that Americans are the only people who can initiate ideas, which does mean that, that European ideas don't necessarily get quite the same chance as an American idea. But um, again, I really must make the point that this is not saying this is what we should do in the future. It's much more saying this is what we should have done in the past. Yes, well, it sounds as if we spend a lot of time looking backwards. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I used to use the contents of doing that. Um, right, yes, we've got one in. Actually, it's from Jerry Stone, um, another oh. fellow, and uh, did all the talks for us on a Apollo. Yeah. Um, right. I was going to say yes. He's so pleased to hear you con your continuing positive views regarding Skylon. As you know, I've been a supporter of this project since its early days. Indeed, I've often stated that in these financially troubled times, it could be a good idea for people to invest in reaction engines. Mm. Can you suggest anything that the general public can usefully do to support their work? Oh, that one's difficult. Um, the reaction engines at the moment uh, seems to have changed from when I was there. It's no longer really pursuing Skylon. I don't know the reasons why it's not, um, because after you know 40, 40 years, the, the technical viability of Skylon is, is well established and undeniable and its importance and economic 
benefit has been proven. I don't know what we can do. I don't know what I, even I can do apart from highlight that Skylon is a doable and very important system. Um, it's you, well, you can't invest in the exchanges because it's still a private company, and so you, you it's not open for public uh, share buying. Um, as I say, I don't have a good answer to that, Jerry, because if I did, I'd be doing it. <laughs> Apart uh, I think from what I am doing, which is to keep emphasising its importance and its uh, its potential. Well, we need more government interest, so um, keep up the good work. We must right. be to the government. It did give that £60 million and it gave it cheerfully, and it gave it in a full knowledge of what Skyline could do. So... Um, yeah, I won't say anything good about the government up till recent times, but since we've had the space agency, um, we are getting a situation in the UK when you do get the impression that the government is at least listening to good ideas and giving them a fair shot. Yes, I think the um, it's recognised that the uh, space industry is a a good contributor to the national economy. So let's yeah. let's keep yeah. it. Uh, what's more encouraging on that, Alistair, is is that things like manned space flight and launch vehicles are no longer off the table. No. Which they were beforehand. It was just don't even bother us with it. Now both things are Britain can get involved and hopefully that will lead to something encouraging. Yep. Be lucky if it was Skylon, but there's other things also going on which are are good. Yes, well, it's all positive. Uh, right, now we've got another one from Ange. He says, I'm now 49 years old, but when I was very a very youngster, I dreamt of up an idea of a space elevator from Earth's surface to low Earth orbit. About mm. 10 to 15 years ago, I saw a media report about it from NASA, I believe. Have you either heard of this or done a concept of, of your own? If not, what is your opinion regarding workability of this? Um, space elevators, I haven't ever done any work on space elevators. They go way, way, way back. Um, R.C. Clarke, Fountains of Paradise, uh, did it. But even when he was doing it, it was already quite a mature concept. Um, the real problem is the strength of the tether material. Um, um, we're getting to the point where we might theoretically have such Materials, I think we're a long way off having them practically. Um, it's a big enterprise. Uh, it would be expensive to put into place. And so even if you could do it technically, you've got to get the volume of traffic into space that would make it worthwhile doing. And of course, you'd have to be able to get to geostationary orbit in the first place in order to build it. So um, it's not a completely silly idea, but I think it is a long way off. It's not an immediate thing that we can use to, uh, to get into orbit. Sorry, I forgot to turn myself on. <laughs> um, right, well, we've got another one from Jerry, Jerry Stone. And mm. um, it, oh, this is quite a long one. I hope I've got time for it. Um, Right, he says one aspect of the space project, that's SPACE, which he's now in charge of within the British Interplanetary Society, mm -hmm. large-scale human settlements in space. Yep. What's the uh, was the assumption that all space habitats would rotate to produce simulated gravity at 1G? In discussing the concept, I, I asked the group, do we need 1G? Could we live under 0.9G, mm -hmm. 0.8G or less? For the most part, things would behave in a pretty similar way to 1G, but there would be less stress on the inhabitants, cardiovascular, muscular, and skeletal systems. So over a very long term, they would live longer and grow taller. Also, there would be less stress on the structure, so less material would be needed in its construction. The real question is, at what point does lowering the gravity become a problem rather than the benefit? Um. The simple answer is we just don't know. We know uh, we know everything about 1G. We know quite a lot about 0G, and we know absolutely nothing about all the G levels in between. Um, if I was doing habitat designs, and I am, as he knows, because we I've consulted with his group, um, 
because I'm doing my own thing um, as part of Scorpion study. Um, I'm assuming 1G simply because if you're going to live there permanently, you're going to want something that uh, actually I think you could make colonies pretty much indistinguishable from living in an Earth city. And, and that you've got to sell it, and that probably is quite a good selling point. Um, and I don't think it's in the thing in the size of colonies, it's not a big issue. In the thing the size of the scorpion, trying to get anything above half a G is um, is is pushing it. Even if even if people aren't sick with the high spin levels, the Coriolis force would make it impractical to live in the cabins. So for the spacecraft like the Scorpion, I think a half G is is probably as much as you could hope for. And really, what I was wanted is the third G. So at least you know when you've arrived at Mars. You're in pretty good shape to cope with the Martian surface, um, and we can worry about readaption to Earth gravity when you get back. Um, so this is this is just a big unknown, and until we get some experimental facilities, put people in them, and find out, you won't know. Um, and it is a very very important thing we're going to need for the future spaceflight. Right. Well, he goes on to say we developed a concept named Island Zero which is a relatively small, low-cost unit that would rotate to produce simulated gravity, mm. comprised of modules launched using Skylon. This would give us the medical research required, particularly to answer this important question. Are you aware of anyone else looking into lower than 1G living? By that, I'm obviously not referring to weightlessness. No, um, and I've seen his Island Zero um, it's, it's, it's over the top for finding out the information you want, um, but he was trying to, to lead up to colonies, so he'd want to know other stuff as well. Um, a variable G experimental facility uh, keeps coming up uh, because anyone who looks at humanity moving into space gets this issue, and you can go back to the um, studies in the 1980s and in the 1990s when NASA commissioned studies about how to advance in space, they always put a variable G laboratory in to find the answers to these questions. But it doesn't have to be as big as your Island Zero. It can be actually, if you had a scorpion, you could get an awful lot of the information just running the scorpion up. At least you get all the information up to half a G. Uh, and you wouldn't need anything too much more complicated than that to get to a full knowledge of all gravity levels between zero and one G. So one, it's a very important thing we need to do in space, but two, we don't need quite something quite as big and as, as grandiose, if I can put it that way, of Island One, which was an interesting little interesting design. So. Right, well, thank you very much for that one, Mark. Um, we've got one in from Michael Franks, who has asked the question, Surely the answer to radiation shielding is water tanks, which we'll need anyway. Yeah, um, or even better, the hydrogen tanks. Um, the problem with that is that you drink the water and you use the hydrogen in the rocket. So if you get your solar storm at the end of the mission, um, you don't have the shielding. And uh, I did see one design, which I rather liked the, the trick of, which was to put the habitation module in a hydrogen tank separate from the main hydrogen tanks, and that was the hydrogen you needed to get back to Earth orbit. So you had that for all the Mars mission and then only used it at the very end when you'd arrived back home. Um, the problem is that in the Scorpion, there is not enough water to do that shielding. Um, so the water tanks aren't that big. So you'd have special water tanks to give the shielding. And I think the plastic I put there probably is a little less technically difficult. Um, but it, 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 it's not silly to say you've got water, you've got hydrogen, you've got these low Z materials that you can use to uh, help the shielding. But um, it's always more difficult to do in practice. The one thing I do not believe, and I've seen it in a lot of Martian reports of Martian studies, is where the, the, the study just says, and we will get a shield by rearranging the equipment to create a shield. Um, 
I've never seen anyone get even close to demonstrating that can be done. So, uh, yeah, not a completely stupid idea. There's not enough water in the Scorpion uh, systems to do it without having essentially special water there. And if I've got special water there, I'd, I'd, I'd rather use the plastic. Again, forgot to turn myself on. Um, <laughs> right, I'm uh, I'm actually now down to the last question. So if anyone's got any more questions, please get them in quickly because we'll be closing the, the, the live uh, Q&A probably in the next 10 minutes. And it's a question from Alex Wood, another member of the society based in Surrey. And he says, uh, how optimistic are you about Skylon? And what do you think is the most likely estimate for when the first Skylon might fly? Ooh. Um, there's, there's, there's two answers to that. There's the answer is technically, would I be confident that Skylon could be built and do what it says it does for the money that we said it would do it in the program timescale we outlined? The answer is I'm absolutely convinced on that. Too many people have spent too much time. You've got to remember that uh, Hotel Skylon between it has is a program already that has been in the order of 200 to 300 million pounds worth of investment. So quite confident it can be done. Now, am I optimistic about it being done? Um, to be honest, no, because it requires human beings to be sensible. And I don't see a lot of evidence of that. Um, it just requires people who've got the capability to, to do their jobs and I don't see it happening. So um, if you ask me how long it would take from that point of let's be sensible and build this thing, um, seven years. Right, we'll hold you to that one. I'm sure there's some people from Reaction Engines listening in on this. We may ring them up later. Give me the 15 billion and I'll have it including the upper stage, because ESA insisted on the upper stage being included as part of the price. The upper stage is actually the thing that gives me the most worries if uh, on, on the system. Mm. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I think we've now reached the end of the list of questions we had. If anyone wants to put one in, they'll have to be quick, because what I'd like to do is thank you very much, Mark, for your excellent presentation to start with and also for answering all these awkward questions. I think we've learned a lot tonight and I really must thank you for, for staying with us and, and, uh, and giving us such excellent answers. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone else who's listening in, wherever you are, and hope that you're staying safe. Now we're going to continue doing this until lockdown is officially, uh, Jerry's come back with another question. Let's see reaction engines, etc. Oh, this is this is some notes. I, I may, I may have to, um, I may have to use them for later, Mark. So let's, uh, I'll send you these. Um, right, let's quickly run through what we've got coming up. On the tenth of June, we have Chris Carberry, who's going to be talking about his book Alcohol in Space. Now that seems to be proving quite popular so far. A lot of people, almost as many people have have, have watched. The, or we'll be watching the video as they watch yours, Mark. So we'll be competing. And then, uh, not announced yet, I'm hoping on the 1st of July to have a very interesting presentation about, um, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be about a BIS piece of kit. So I'll say no more at the moment. And then we're looking for putting program together for August, because we still think most of us will be in lockdown, and maybe even September. So we're hoping we might even get back into the BIS from October onwards, but we'll wait and see. So thank you very, very much for, for listening. We'll look forward to seeing you all again and, uh, and join us for the next conference. And thanks again, Mark, and thanks, Alan, for making it happen.